EQ is an awesome tool, but sometimes we need it to move around dynamically when our inputs change. So today we're gonna to be talking about dynamic EQ and multiband compression, when to use each one, how they're different, and if you stay to the end, I've got some pro tips for you as well. Hey, if you're new here, my name's James and I help sound tech save the day by making enjoyable mixes and removing distractions from your audio. So whether that's with your band or at church, I'm here to help you make every mix enjoyable. If that's you, go ahead and mash that subscribe button to join the club of sound ninjas. To understand dynamic EQ and multiband compression, you really have to understand the basics of what EQ does, what compression does, and how crossovers work. I'm going to assume that you already know that EQ changes the frequency balance of our signal with gain, frequency, and bandwidth. If you're not familiar with those, I'll drop a link in the description below so that you can find out more about the basics and then come back and pick up right here. Dynamics processors, like compressors and expanders, will change the dynamic range of the signal, or the way that it gets louder and quieter. A downward compressor, which is the compressor that you're seeing on your console most of the time, lets the input signal come into a certain point, and then above that point, turns it down at the output. By turning down the peaks, you've reduced the dynamic range of that signal. The next most common dynamics processor is your expander, or related to that, a gate. An expander will turn down the signal while it's below the threshold. This is helpful for getting rid of noise or unwanted sounds coming through that channel. A gate is a harder version of an expander, and usually a gate lets us choose exactly how much we want to turn down our signal while it's below the threshold. An expander actually applies a ratio below the threshold, but that's for another day. For dynamic EQ and multiband compression, we can actually use an upward expander as well, where as the signal level goes above a certain point, we will increase the dynamic range or push that signal up further on the output than it was on the input. The final building block you really need to understand for multiband compression specifically is the crossover. A crossover uses a series of high and low pass filters in combination to divide the frequency spectrum into different regions. This is most commonly seen with speaker systems, where certain components will reproduce certain frequencies better than others, so we use a crossover network to assign certain frequency ranges to certain drivers. We're not gonna go really deep into that in this video, but just know that the crossover point is the point where we're dividing the signal into a section above that point and a section below that point. If we have more than one crossover point, we can divide the frequency spectrum into different sections, and this is where we get multiband compression. What you really need to understand is that the frequency you pick for the crossover point says I wanna process the signal one way below this point and another way above this point. Okay, our recap of the basics is done, but the more you understand the fundamentals of these basic processors, the easier time you'll have putting these more complex dynamic processors into use. So let's dive into dynamic EQ first. Dynamic EQ will let you do all the normal things that you do with an equalizer. Gain, frequency, bandwidth, and even shape. But added to all that is the dynamics part. The first thing we need to decide with our dynamic EQ is whether we want to push down the signal as the input level goes up, or like compression, or if we want the signal to go upward with increased input, like expansion. Sometimes that's called above and below. Let's take a look at this example on the acoustic guitar. So what we're gonna take a look at today is an acoustic guitar recording. That's me. And to listen first, we've got some minimal EQ, just a high pass filter, and I've got a little bit of compression going on, but nothing fancy. So let's listen to the strummed part and the finger picked part, and then we'll apply our dynamic EQ and see how that's going. All right, so neither of those sound really bad, but when we're mixing, we're in a dynamic environment, right? We want it to get louder in certain sections, but we might not want it to be that present in the mid-range uh, so that it's taking up that space. So I'm gonna come over to my dynamic EQ and put that in. And right here on band number four, I'm at 1.7K. 
I've got my range turned down 8 dB and I've set my threshold so that it's going to be ducking when it's strumming. But when it goes back to finger picking, that mid range is going to come back. In a second, we'll take a look at the attack and release time, but let's just listen to what it's like right here. So let's listen to what it's like on just the finger picked part. If I just take that same cut that I might have had for the strummed part, and we're just going to turn it down with static EQ or just your normal EQ. And for now, I'm going to put this threshold all the way up so that it's not behaving the same way. So I'm turning it down by about the same amount that it would have on the strummed parts when it was getting duck. But now let's listen to the finger picked part and see if we like it this way or not. So you can tell when we're ducking that part of the mid range on the finger picked part, we're losing some of that definition or that forwardness that we want to have, right? The guitars come down in level, but we want it to kind of pop out more in those details in that moment where we might not want all that mid range coming through when it's strumming. So now let's take a look at the attack and the release time. I'm going to put this back, pull this down on the strummed part. So we're just going to loop the strummed part so that we can hear the difference on what it's like with the different attack and release times. Those are another thing that you can play around with with your dynamic EQ. So when I turn the attack time really slow, that initial transient or the real hit of the pick click on the strings gets through, but it doesn't duck it quite as fast. So the pick click comes through, but the ringing of the strings up in those upper overtones and harmonics, those still get ducked a little bit. So we can tell there's a difference when I turn it really fast, we lose a lot of that pick click. All right, so that's cool. We can choose whether or not we want to keep that transient part in or not. You know, on any knob, on any device, usually straight up and down is a good middle of the road setting right there. Guessing that this is about average for what you want. So it's hard to go wrong with straight up the middle. Let's listen to the release time and see how we can play with that. Again, that balance between the ring of the strings and the attack that's coming through on that compressed part. So let's listen to different release times. So as I speed up the release time, we can get more of that ringing coming back up after the initial kind of hit pushes that EQ band down. So if you're wanting it to stay more like one mode for strumming and one mode for picking, you know, having a much slower release time might work really well. And it's not going to be like you're not affecting the entire frequency range. You're just affecting that one frequency band. So that can be helpful. Uh, even to go pretty slow on the release time if you don't want things to jump around. I could see visually on there that it was jumping around when I had my release time really fast, but I couldn't really hear necessarily that it was causing problems. But maybe if I was paying a little closer attention, uh, I would be able to hear it. Let me know down in the comments if you hear acting funny, not just looking funny, uh, when I play it again with the faster release time.
all right, so that's pretty cool. We've played around with those parameters. So hopefully when you're messing around with it, you know a little bit more of what you're looking for and the things you can do with it. One other fun thing that you can do with dynamic EQ is you've got different bands. And let's say that one of the notes sticks out a little bit more than the rest. So let me loop the finger picking part real quick. And this A note, the open A string, to me in my studio right now sounds a little bit louder than some of the other bass notes. Maybe it's just my studio monitors and the way that, you know, my room resonance. Um, maybe it's not. But this might also happen for you with your guitar or in your room, there's one note that's sticking out or hanging on longer than the others. So we can actually target that note. You can actually learn the frequencies of the different notes. And A is actually a really easy one because A440 is 440 hertz. That's the A above middle C. So we're down two octaves from that. And so I know this note is at 110 hertz. So I can even just type in 110. I can make my Q pretty narrow. Doesn't need to be super, super narrow. Let's use our gain to make sure that we're kind of in the right spot. Uh, and then we can take that range down so that we can compress just that one note a little bit more if it's jumping out at us. I don't know if it's jumping out at you. It was for me when I was listening in my studio monitors. Let's check it out. So we can duck that one note just a little bit more. And, you know, if we're going to get real persnickety, we can do that. And that's one of the benefits of dynamic EQ. We can get very precise in the way that we turn things down and when we turn them down. So we're not turning it down all the time. We're just turning it down when it's jumping out at us. This is the point where understanding attack and release times really help you dial in your dynamic EQ. Because we can tell this EQ to respond faster or slower over time, we can take the shape of that transient and its EQ curve and make some adjustments that we wouldn't be able to do with EQ or compression alone. A faster attack time on a boost is gonna make that really punchy and stand out very quickly, but the level comes back down to normal or even cut after that hit comes and goes. If our release time is too slow, we could end up boosting the flabby resonances that we didn't wanna amplify in the first place. Otherwise, we would have used just a static EQ. So that's dynamic EQ in a nutshell. Let's move on. Multiband compression operates very similarly to dynamic EQ, but it allows us to treat an entire frequency range rather than one frequency that we select, whether that's wide or narrow with the Q control on our dynamic EQ. Now you could have a very narrow band that you treat with your multiband compression, and that's where we start to blur the lines between dynamic EQ and multiband compression. A lot of the controls are very similar, except the frequency that you choose is the crossover point, or the point where you want the two bands to overlap and you're treating it differently above that point and below that point. One of my favorite ways to use multiband compression is on vocals that have a lot of different tonality between when they sing high and when they sing low. Now, if you have full upward and downward control of your multiband compressor, you can try to get more punch out of your drums in a couple different ways. So let's check that out. All right, let's take a look and see at what we can do with multiband compression on a drum bus. So I've got C6 here. I'll go ahead and engage it. Uh, but let's actually listen first without it engaged. So then we can listen and see what it's doing and how we're going to set it up, what we can do to shape our drum sounds. Our drum sounds here aren't bad. I didn't go through and mix them really specifically. They were just good drum sounds to begin with. So it's easy to do. Let's listen to a section. There's a tom fill and then it gets into the regular beat. Okay, so that's not bad. Let's engage C6. And then we're gonna pull down the threshold here on this low band and on this upper mid band. And we'll just see how it feels different and how we can shape uh, the dynamics of this drum bus a little bit.
So the drums weren't bad before, but we definitely got a little bit more punch by pulling down the threshold on the low band. So we can see here that it's everything below 86 hertz. That's what's getting sent over to this band here. And you can say we've got the range here at negative eight. That's how far we will let the compression turn that band down. And when you have the attack and release time here of 34, 35 milliseconds, and a release time of 40 milliseconds, this attack time here uh, means that our compressor will wait, or it's gonna take 34 milliseconds, 35 milliseconds, before it pushes the signal down in that frequency band as the input signal goes up. It's compressing it, it's just compressing it slowly. Listen to what happens when I speed this up. We're doing the same thing just with a faster attack time on the bottom end. So we lost the punch that we had before. Let me put it back to about where it was. And now we'll compare again. So you can hear that the faster attack time, we're taking out some of those lower frequencies. Now, if you're listening on your phone or your laptop speakers or something, you're going to have a harder time hearing those low frequency differences. If you're listening on a big PA and it's at like, you know, 90 dB SPL, you're going to hear those differences a lot more. So the level that you're listening at is going to make a big difference on that. And there are things that you can hear in a live sound situation with punchy subwoofers that don't always translate over recordings in YouTube. So let's look back and forth again over here with the, the high mid band. So this two to eight K range. So we're 1.8 to 77.8 K. And let's bypass this single band and see what the difference is with that. The attack time's at four milliseconds. The release time is at nine milliseconds, almost 10. We'll see what that sounds like with and without that band compressing. So you can hear there's a little bit of a difference. It's not earth shatteringly different, but it does feel a little bit tighter to me. And I can't explain why exactly. It's just, it gives a feeling and that's kind of what you're after. With multiband compression, you're after baby steps. You're not totally gonna change the shape of your sound and the way that things feel in a broad scale, but it's gonna be those little baby steps that get your sounds bigger and fuller and punchier. And we're gonna take those one by one. All right, now let's take a look at a different way to set up our drums bottom end. So before we had our range down here at like negative eight or so, and the gain was at zero, so it was more like this. Now let's put the range actually up positive and the gain down negative so that in its normal state, we're turning down this low end, but as we pull the threshold down, we're actually gonna expand those lower frequencies and they're gonna go up when the signal comes in and then come back down when it's not there. So this would be handy if you had a situation where you've got rumble coming through that you don't want. It's kind of like a frequency specific expansion. Let's listen to what that's like. We'll start with the threshold up. You can notice the attack and the release time are different. Here I've got a very fast attack time so that it can push up and push open as fast as possible. And then the release time is a little bit slower uh, so that it can come down a little bit smoother. Let's take a listen.
So that's kind of fun. It's a different way to shape it. It's a different way to use your Dynamics processors to push up that low end, to make it have a certain shape or a different sound. So there are lots and lots of different options that you can try when you have multiband compression or expansion. The options are endless. It's way, way fun to try and experiment with these. As you're experimenting with dynamic EQ and multiband compression, here are some pro tips to help keep you out of the weeds and not make the same mistakes I've made. Sometimes you can solo an individual band of your dynamic EQ or multiband compression, which can be really helpful when you're trying to identify something specific, but really not helpful in the middle of a show. One time I was using a dynamic EQ as a de and I had the top band soloed. So whenever this singer sang, it sounded really thin and I couldn't figure out what it was. I tried warming it up with all the other EQ bands. I tried everything I could think of and then I found that little solo button. So please don't do that and make that same mistake I made. Now, if you've got a high-end PA and a really great band, you might start to hear phase changes between the different bands on your multiband compression. So maybe the switch from multiband compression to dynamic EQ could be good for you. And finally, don't forget to address the source. So many of these problems could be solved if we solved them on stage. And that's really the pro way to do it. Solve everything at the source and things get a lot better. We don't have to try to put band-aids on it with all these fancy tools. Music should usually sound good without a whole lot of band-aids from the audio system. Just because we have the powerful tools to fix things doesn't mean it's the best way to do it. So putting this into use, you actually have to find the dynamic EQ or multiband compressor to actually use it. And if you're on a Digico console, good for you. You've got dynamic EQ on almost all your channels. It's super cool that they included that. If you're not, you can try to find it in your console's effects rack. You can find it on the Allen & Heath, Avantis, and DLive consoles, as well as the Yamaha CL and QL series. Oh, and the Behringer Wing has it as well. If you have a way to insert plugins with a computer or you've got Wave Super Rack, you can try the C6 or F6. Those work brilliantly and I really enjoy having those in my tool belt. They're not my go-to, I don't have to have them, but they can be really helpful. If you've got a favorite plugin that you use for this kind of stuff, let me know down in the comments below. Actually using these tools requires that you have the time during sound check to get them tweaked and dialed in. So if you wanna streamline your sound check and make sure that you're not missing anything, download my sound check checklist. You can find it through the link in the description below. And if you're wanting more tips and ideas for starting places on how to apply EQ and compression to your sources, I've got a book for you called the Live Mixing Field Guide. It's a spiral bound color printed book full of tips and tricks and my starting places and things that I'm listening for when I'm mixing so that I can make great decisions quickly. You can find it at livemixingfieldguide.com or through the link in the description below. As always, remember, it's all about the low end, avoid the sound tech solo and nobody leaves humming the kick drum. Be sure to subscribe and mash that like button and we'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio.